Let's go to John chapter 20 tonight. John chapter 20. And just uh, next week we'll be finishing up the Gospel of John. And so today we're going to be looking at the resurrection. Of course, I I love the resurrection. And uh, we're talking about Jesus Christ, the risen Lord tonight. So let's go ahead and start reading in verse 1. It says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and the other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. Now I'm going to stop here for a minute. That was John that outran Peter. It's funny, John's writing this, but he never like refers to himself as me. Uh, it's kind of weird how he does that, but he always kind of refers to himself like he's talking about somebody else. And so I, I don't know for sure what the point was of that. I don't know if he's just trying to be humble. Um, you know, he didn't want to look like he's bragging, like, and I ran faster than Peter. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't totally understand the significance of that. But we see that in this chapter, and there's several times in the book of John where we see that. But verse 5, and he stooping down, talking about himself, and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed, for as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. So right here in this story, notice how you know it mentions that when he looked in there, he saw the linen clothes lying there. You know, the things that Jesus was wrapped up in, the things he was buried in, they're all lying there. And then it mentions the napkin that was laying in another place by itself, all laying there neatly. Okay, now there's a story, you know, I, this, this could be true, there could be significance to it, there might not be. I'm skeptical, because anytime somebody brings up Jewish tradition, I get nervous. And they bring this stuff up a lot of time to disprove something in the Bible. Some of it might le- be legit, some of it might not be. I don't get too crazy about it unless it's something that's mentioned in the Bible. But they'll talk about the folded napkin, the folded napkin. They would talk about how, you know, when they have a dinner, uh, you know, they'd eat a meal or something, if they were impressed... They liked it, you know, they'd fold that napkin up, meaning they were going to come back. You know, if they didn't care for it, they'd just kind of wad it up and leave it there like that, meaning they weren't impressed. And so, you know, Jesus, he folded the napkin, meaning he's coming again. And, you know, and it makes a great story. But I don't know for sure that that's exactly what it is, because first of all, he's not going to go back to the tomb, you know. And, you know, it's not that he's going to come back to earth again. He's already still on earth. What I personally think the significance of it was, and there, you know, it's he was just he did that. Everything's kind of there neatly, just showing the body wasn't taken. Okay, when you steal, when people steal something, what do they usually do? They usually leave a mess behind. Okay, and if they steal a body, a dead body, they're not going to take the linen clothes and things off of it. You know, they're not going to fold up the napkin and set it somewhere. I think Jesus just did this, showing that you know he got up on his own. And, you know, he was not stolen, which is what they immediately thought when they saw that his body wasn't there. So I personally think that's what it is. Always get skeptical when they try bringing up Jewish tradition into stuff, because that means it was probably something they heard from a Jew and means it was probably a lie. Okay. And so unless it was something from the Old Testament, and I'm going to show you something too, uh, something that you know, confuses people greatly on this chapter. And I'm going to go back to Jewish tradition, but I'm going to go back to Jewish tradition that we see in the Bible. And so I think that's, that is appropriate to do that. But going off a of tradition, you see in some book somewhere, while the napkin thing makes a great story, it's a good camp meeting move, gets everybody fired up and riled up, you know, let, let's not make too big a deal out of that, all right? Let's keep, let's keep ourselves skeptical when it comes to Jewish tradition. But notice, though, uh, in this story, it mentions... Um, in verse 9, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Okay? They didn't know the scripture. Now, you know, that's interesting because, you know, it was obviously something that was prophesied and it was something that Jesus flat out said multiple times. 
Jesus flat out told them on many occasions that he was going to rise from the dead. Okay, I mean, he, he it, it, multiple times. Go ahead and turn over to Luke chapter 24 and verses 4 through 8. It says, And it came to pass when they were much perplexed thereabout, because the body wasn't there. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, and they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth. They said to them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. So the angel brought it up, say, Hey, he told you this was going to happen. He told you that he was going to die. He told you three days later he was going to rise again. But it says here in John that they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again. What's going on here? Well, you know what? Sometimes we can hear things without processing it, can't we? Okay. I mean, that's happened many times. I, I've listened to messages before or you know, we've read something in the scriptures. Sometimes we just don't process what we hear. Sometimes... All right, you won't hurt my feelings, but sometimes when, you know, if, have you ever been listening to one of my sermons and just went one in your and out the other? I mean, you know, what would happen if we took a quiz after every message that was preached, okay? And listen, you're, you're listening, you hear every word I'm saying, but we don't always process everything, do we? We don't, because we're, we're just not always paying attention. You know, sometimes our minds are on other things. You know, sometimes, sometimes we hear something, but we get the wrong idea. And there's been many times I've preached a message and then somebody's come up to me afterwards and had a question or a concern and they took something I said just completely wrong. And I'm like, no, that is not what I meant at all. And, you know, and the, you know, and listen, that happens to everybody, but there are some people that are very prone to that. People who are, you know, just very negative and just have a bad attitude. And they always take everything the wrong way. And, you know, those people never stay around real long. We had a guy who came here, he only came here a few times, but it was amazing some of the things he heard me say that nobody else heard me say. And I was warned about this guy. Somebody told me he was a real problem and a real pain in the neck. And I, you know, I, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. And I remember he didn't show up one week, and I remember I went and visited him. And you know, he's like, well, if you're wondering why I wasn't there Sunday, your, week, your message you preached a couple weeks ago, uh, there's a few things you said in there that bothered me. And then he went and it was just like, you know, first of all, yeah, that wasn't what I said. I in no way meant that. Third of all, you're an idiot for even thinking that. Now I didn't say that, but I was thinking that. And I thought back to those words that I, you know, I was warned about that guy. I was like, wow, he was right. And you know what I told, you know what I told that man? I don't know. I said, you know, cause he's like, we think we're going to, Go back to our old church. You know what I told him? I think you should. <laughs> and, I, and I did. I, I encouraged him to go back to his old church. And you know what? I meant it. I wasn't just being polite. I encouraged him. To go, you, you go give them your problems. And I, I, don't want, I don't want to put up with you because uh, you're an idiot. But you know, sometimes we, we hear things, we get the wrong idea. You know, They heard when Jesus said that. Once again, they didn't understand it. They didn't process it. Maybe they got the wrong idea about it. Maybe they thought he was speaking figuratively. You know, and sometimes we can even know all the right words of something. We can know the words of the scripture. We can even have it memorized, but it's never reached our heart. There's a lot of people who know John 3.16, but they don't understand John 3.16. Think about how many people there are that know John 3.16, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And yet they think you have to do good works to get saved. They know John 3.16 and they still think you have to do good works to get saved. How can that be? They know John 3.16 and believe you can lose your salvation. Even though it says, whoever believes in them will not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, how can you have something everlasting and then lose it? Unless it wasn't everlasting. Think about that. How many people, one of the most well-known verses in the Bible... And yet, most of the people who know that verse think you have to do some kind of work to be saved and think you can lose your salvation. How is that? That verse has not reached their hearts. And, under, and I was talking about it in a message before. don't remember which one. But listen, you have to have the Holy Spirit 
to teach you. The Holy Spirit is the best teacher. And you know, there were things, there were certain things that the disciples didn't get. You know, some of it, it's like, I don't, I don't know for sure if they were supposed to get it. You know, it, it just wasn't time yet. You know, I, I you know, it, it's, it's hard to say on some of those things, but it's clear none of them got the scripture concerning the resurrection. Even though Jesus flat out told them more than once, it went right over their heads. They didn't get it. And so that ought to challenge us to make sure that, you know what? Hey, just because I've got something memorized doesn't mean I understand that scripture. And I want to understand it. I want to understand it right. And that's why we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us. You know, open up my understanding. Make this clear to me. I want to get it right. I don't want to miss out on something because my understanding was wrong or because my heart wasn't right. And so this is what's going on here, right? <clears throat> Nobody should have been surprised about the resurrection, but they were all surprised. They were all surprised. And because they did not yet know the scripture, yet they did hear the words, probably even remember the words, but they didn't know it. It had not gotten into their hearts. Therefore, they didn't understand it. And nobody was there waiting when Jesus rose from the dead. And even Thomas, we're going to see a little bit later, even after it happened, he still didn't believe it. Even though you know when this conversation's going on, they probably said, no, no, remember what Jesus said? He told us, he flat out told us that this was going to happen. But once again, you know, his heart wasn't ready. Thomas had a heart problem. And that was why it took so long. So look at verse 11. It says, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and see two angels in, in white sitting the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Now, I, a message I preached a long time ago is... Uh, about the questions of angels. I, I, and in that message, I, if you, I go through the Bible and I show every time angels ask people questions. And it's interesting when you look at that because you know a lot of times Jesus would ask questions trying to get them thinking. I don't believe the angels did that. I believe the angels asked questions because they wanted to know. And remember in Luke 24, we read, they said, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here for he is risen as he said, but listen, they weren't seeking for the living. Were they, they were seeking for the dead. And yet they said that, and, but it was like the angels didn't understand that. Hey, remember how he told you this was going to happen? Angels. I don't think they understand lack of faith. I don't think angels understand disobedience. Whenever you see the story of Hagar, when she had prayed, because, you know, she got cast out and she's there with Ishmael and she thinks she's going to die and she prays. And then an angel comes, you know, I was like, what aileth thee? What are you worried about? Didn't you just pray? You know, God heard your prayer, but listen, do we not often pray and then still worry after that? Why is that? It's called a lack of faith. Angels who know God, they don't understand that. They understand that, hey, you can count on God. God keeps his promises. Every word of the Bible is true. You know, there's no need to doubt. What's wrong with you? You know, woman, why weepest thou? Why are you crying? What is the point? Why are you crying? You should be happy. Jesus is risen, as he said, but she was crying because. She thinks they stole the body of Jesus because she did not understand the scriptures. Angels don't get that. And when you see, you know, I think there's something to be learned from angels and just their, their faith that they have. They don't get it. Remember after Jesus ascended into heaven, what was the last thing he tells them? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He, that's the last thing he tells them. And here they all are. And I totally get it. Standing open mouth, looking into the sky after Jesus ascends into heaven. That's exactly what I would have done. But what do the angels do? Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus which is taken from you is going to come back in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Hey, what are you all doing standing there with your mouths hanging open? Jesus just told you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Angels don't understand why we don't obey right away. Angels obey. Remember that when Jesus talked about offending the little ones and it talks about how the angels do always behold the face of the Father? You know, what's, what's that saying? 
When you offend a little child, those angels are looking at God just waiting for him to give the slightest nod to go take care of that person that offended the kid. And as soon as all God's got to do is just give him a little nod or whatever, and boom, they're on it. That guy's toast. And angels don't understand lack of disobedience. So, you know, it's an interesting thing. Anytime you see angels asking questions in the Bible, I think it's because they want to know the answers. They don't get it. They don't understand lack of faith. They don't understand why somebody wouldn't believe what Jesus said. They don't understand why somebody wouldn't obey Jesus. You know, these angels, they're the ones who often carried out the judgment for people who disobeyed. They know what kind of punch they pack, you know, they pack. You know, they know what kind of damage they can do. And these people who have complete, these angels have complete faith in God, you know, knowing what kind of destruction he can do, they see all of us who won't listen to God, and they got to be thinking, these people are crazy. Why would they not obey God? You know, there's something we can learn from that. Let's just, let's just trust God. Let's do what he says. So, um, but yeah, their questions, it was all, it was always coming up when people were doubting or they weren't completely obeying. They didn't under, they, they didn't understand that. So look at verse 14. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener saith to him, sir, if they, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Now, I want want you to notice a few things in this passage. One that causes a lot of questions is why did Jesus tell Mary not to touch him? Okay. Now he tell he tells her here, don't touch me because I've not yet ascended to my father. But then later, well, uh, look at um, uh, Luke twenty four thirty nine. Luke chapter twenty four thirty nine. Talking to his disciples. This is after this encounter with Mary. It says, "Behold, my hands and my feet. It is I myself." Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. So Jesus tells Mary, you can't touch me. He tells the disciples, you can touch me. Now, how do we explain this? All right. Because this, you know, this looks kind of sexist here, doesn't it? All right. You know, all, and all you women should be getting offended right now. You know, if you're a typical American woman, how come the men can touch Jesus, but the women can't? And you know what? I've got my I, I've got an opinion on this. And you know what? I can't for say this for sure. This is it because the Bible does not spell it out. The Bible does not tell us here why. I will say this. All right, I, I've looked at some of the other theories that are out there, and it is it, it's it's funny the reaction some people get. You know, there's one theory I heard out there by one guy that it has to do with this you know priestly thing. There's a time. Of, un, of where they have to remain pure and nothing unclean can touch them. And Jesus was still in that time. But later on, when he's with the disciples, it was past that time. And they go back into all this stuff with the priest. And um, I think that's lame because I, I, I believe it was the same day when he's telling the disciples to handle them. And so uh, I, I don't think that has anything to do with it. Uh, another thing, if you look at... Um, other Bible versions, okay? All the other Bible versions, they say, the way they say it, and I, I don't have any of them in front of me, but they all say that, you know, make it like, um, well, it says, let me find the verse here, see if I can remember how it say, says it. Uh, it says in verse 20, or verse 16, she turned herself in him and said, Rabboni, which is to say, Master, Jesus saith unto her, touch me not. What they somehow in there they they have it like she was like grabbing on to him, like she was already touching him, and she's and he's basically saying you know let go of me, I've got things to do you know I've got to go to the disciples, but 
It, that's not what it says in this King James Bible. All the other versions have her like hanging on to him, touching him, and there, you know, therefore, you know, and, and we, we all know the other versions aren't trustworthy. So how do we explain this? You know, why was it not okay for Mary to touch him? Well, I personally believe it's, it's very possible that Mary was in a time of uncleanness. And now the Bible doesn't say that, but her touching him would have made him ceremonially unclean. Okay, now this was now what I'm saying here would freak out a lot of people, okay? Because of the whole, you know, what did he say on the cross? It is finished, all right? You know, the it is the back to the it is finished argument. But listen, I'm going to show you some things that Jesus had to do even after his ascension, all right? Understand, you know, that you know at the end of you know the death of the testator, you know, that's the end of the Old Testament, all right? But listen, there were still some things that Jesus had to do in heaven. And so, but first of all, turn to Leviticus chapter 15. Said, I don't know for sure that this is it. This is just what I personally think. It, I think I think it makes sense. But it says in Leviticus chapter 15 and verse 19, and if a woman have an issue and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days and whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean until the even and everything that she lieth upon her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that sitteth upon she sitteth upon shall be unclean, and whosoever toucheth her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until even. And whosoever toucheth anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and shall be unclean until even. And if it be on her bed or on anything whereon she sitteth, when he toucheth it, he shall be unclean until even. And if any man lie with her at all and her flowers be upon him, he shall be unclean seven days, and all the bed whereon he lieth shall be unclean. So right here we see you know, that woman who's in that time, there's, a, there's that purification time, and it's seven days. And anything she touches, ceremonially is unclean. Now listen, when Jesus died on the cross, okay, Jesus completed all those things. You know, we don't, we don't go off those things anymore. We don't have those ceremonial laws of uncleanness. Jesus finished those. But here's the question, did he finish that at the cross, or was it after the cross he finished it? Because turn over to Hebrews chapter 9. Because notice what Jesus said, I have not yet ascended to my Father. Okay, that was So there was a reason why she couldn't touch Him. Jesus had not yet ascended to the Father. And it says in Hebrews 9 verse 11, But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Is that talking about the holy place or the temple on earth? No, because the Bible says it's not the one made with hands. Okay, And there's, there's other verses in the Bible that shows that the temple that was on earth, it was kind of a replica of one that was in heaven. Okay, And Jesus, he went and he sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. Now, when would he have done that? Did he do that in the three days that he, you know, did he go, you know, like Ruckman said, did he go through the heart of the earth and lead captivity to heaven, go to heaven and do all that stuff? No, he couldn't have done that because the Bible said he was going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay, not in heaven, he said in the heart of the earth. And after he's resurrected, I mean, this is, I mean, within probably just a few hours after he's resurrected, he told Mary, I have not yet ascended to my father. So Jesus had not gone into the holy place yet. Jesus had not offered his blood upon the altar in heaven. He had shed his blood on the earth, but he still had to do some things in heaven. And he hadn't done it yet. And so Jesus needed to remain ceremonially, ceremonially clean. And so he could not, I believe that was why he couldn't be touched by Mary at that point. Jump down to verse 24 of Hebrews chapter 9. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. 
For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. All right, so these guys that go around screaming the it is finished argument, they forget about the fact that Jesus had to go and actually perform the duties of a high priest in the temple that's in heaven. And he did not do that until after the cross, after the resurrection, after his 40 days on earth, when he ascended and went to the Father in heaven. He went into the temple and he went and he did those ceremonial things and it was a one-time thing. Not like the high priest who had to do it every year. He did it one time and he'll never have to do it again. And so, while, you know, so when did the Old Testament end? When did all those ceremonial things end? Was it at the cross? Or was it after the ascension into heaven? And I think we have to say it was after the ascension into heaven because the fact Jesus told Mary, don't touch me not, I have not yet ascended to my Father. Jesus could not be ceremonially, ceremonial, I can't say the word, ceremonially unclean. And so that would be why she couldn't touch him and the disciples could. That's my opinion. And, you know, that's not a salvation issue. If somebody disagrees with that, you know, I'm not, I'm not mad at you. Uh, but that's just, that, that's the only thing I can figure out. And um, I, I don't believe Jesus told her, touch me not, meaning, you know, let go of me. I've got something to do. I think it was because she was not supposed to touch him. And you might think that's sexist. But you know what? Get over it, all right? That's just, you know, I'm sorry. We're not going to change the Bible to make 21st century women, you know, feel more comfortable, all right? It's just, it just is what it is. So anyway, uh, so um, look at verse 18. I got to get back to John chapter 20. Verse 18. It says, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Uh, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Now, a few things here is, you know, you would think after the resurrection, the disciples would have been a little more bold. But what are they doing? They're having a meeting together and they've got the door shut. Okay, remember those verses? I, I get all, all my messages, they all run together. I don't remember, but I was, I was preaching one of my messages here just recently and I'm talking about, you know, what we've heard in secret, you know, that declare on the housetops. You know, we're very public with our message. We're very loud with our message. We're trying to get it out there. But what are these guys doing right now? They're acting like a bunch of Baptists. They're closing their doors. They're doing everything in private. You know, don't let anybody hear what's going on. You know, let's meet together out of obligation because it's what we're supposed to do, you know, for fear of the Jews. But listen, they know now Jesus is resurrected from the dead. What are they scared of? What are they scared of? Because you would think after that, to when you realize that Jesus has power over death, after they had seen him raise people from the dead, after Jesus raises himself from the dead, you would think they'd be like, you know what? If I get killed, Jesus wants he'll just raise me from the dead. I'm not going anywhere unless it's the will of God. You would think that would have got these guys so fired up, man. They had to kick the doors open and they would have, they just, you know what? Let's have an open air meeting. You know, let, we're meeting outside today. You know, let's just, let's go cause some trouble, man. Let's go, you know, preach the gospel. Let's see if we can get somebody to try to kill us today. Let's see if it even works. You know, probably, I mean, you would think that's the kind of confidence they would have had, but no, they didn't. There they are, you know, they're kind of hiding out. And Jesus, the Bible says, the doors were closed, and then all of a sudden he stood in the midst of them. Now that's pretty cool right there. Jesus has basically teleported, for lack of a better term, into the room. That's pretty neat. Especially since, too, this isn't a this isn't a spirit, because he told him, remember, handle me, for a spirit hath not flesh and bone. Jesus had flesh and bone. Jesus even ate after the resurrection. 
he had still had a physical body because he physically resurrected from the dead. And notice too how he shows them, you know, those those nail prints in his hands. He showed them his his uh, side. Why is he doing that? You know, he's letting them know I'm not a doppelganger. All right, you know, I'm not I'm not just a lookalike. This is, in fact, me. And it is. It's interesting. He left those there. I think he did that as an identifier. You know, you, you, you don't walk around with a big hole in your hand and in your side. Okay? We, we, you know, we couldn't do that. All right? But Jesus did that, I believe, as an identifier so they would know that it was, in fact, him that had risen from the dead, leaving no doubt in their minds at all. And so... Um, you know, Jesus, he, you know, notice too, when he's talking to me, he, he's repeatedly saying peace, you know, after he appears in there, you know, he says, peace be unto you. And, you know, and later he says again, he keeps saying, he keeps saying peace. You know why? Because they needed comfort. They were scared and he keeps telling them, Hey, peace. All right. Be at peace. You've got nothing to be scared of. Look who's back. Look who's here. You all saw them kill me. You know I was dead, but here I am again. You know what? Peace. And you know, as Christians, it's pretty sad how worked up we get sometimes. It's pretty sad how scared we get of things sometimes. We have no business being scared of anything. Okay? God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. Okay? Even though we weren't there for that, we say we believe the Scriptures, so why would we be scared of these things? It's easy for us to be down on the disciples and to say things like, what were they worried about? You know, if Jesus, you know, they, they were going to die with uh, Jesus. Okay. Well, do we think it's any different with us? So, you know, we have, we have no excuse. It's easy for us to get down on the disciples, but we don't have any excuse. So look at verse 21 it says, then said Jesus unto them again, peace be unto you as my father has sent me. Even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Okay. And the significance, I believe, of Jesus breathing on them is he is giving them power and authority. Okay. That's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty big thing he said there. You know, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted. Whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. What is he doing there? Jesus is giving them authority. He has given them the authority to go and build his church and to go and spread the gospel. He's given them the authority to baptize people, you know, to ordain people. And what do they do? They, that's something they pass on. We see Jesus breathing on them, saying, receive the Holy Ghost. Later on, the book of Acts you see the disciples laying hands on people and saying, receive you the Holy Ghost. What are they doing? They're transferring that authority. They're, transfer, they're transferring that authority. You know, I don't believe in just, you know, self-ordained pastors, somebody just going and, you know, you know I'm, I'm going to be a pastor and I'm going to go start a church. Well, you know, you need to be sent out of a church. You need to be sent out. Uh, you know, you need to have someone lay, lay hands on you. Why do we do it? That's what they did in the Bible. Okay? The authority that those disciples had, it was a real authority. It came from Jesus Christ himself. And you know what? He said, freely you receive, freely give. And you know what? They would go and those who they felt worthy, they would lay hands on them and they would receive the Holy Ghost. They would, they would give them power. They were giving them authority to go so they could ordain elders. You know, you had Paul, you know, who had ordained Titus and could, could told Titus to go and ordain elders in every city. Okay? What was he trying to have him do? He, you know, he's given him authority and he's wanting him to pass that authority on to others who are worthy. In the Bible, we have you know, the qualifications for a bishop and for a deacon, someone who's ordained. And the Bible says, lay hands suddenly on no man. We shouldn't just go around ordaining people you know, just because someone asked. They need to be proved first. They need to be someone who has showed themselves faithful, someone who meets certain qualifications because, folks, this is serious business. Okay? Starting a church, it's, it's serious stuff. And it's not something that we ought to take lightly and be careless with. And so, I believe that's what Jesus is doing here when He's breathing on them. He's not just giving them authority, but He's also empowering them. 
Okay, God is not going to ask us to do something and not give us the tools to do it with, is He? God wants us to do things like, you know, start churches. God wants us to win souls. That's a miracle. Every time someone gets saved, it's a miracle. A miracle. God wants us to preach the gospel. God wants us to try to help people change their lives and get their lives on track. And you know, God wants us to do those things. Well, we can't do any of those things without the power of God, can we? We have to have the power of God if we're going to get a church going, if we're going to see people saved, if we're going to make a difference, we have to have the power of God and and he gives he gives that to us. He wants us to have that power. And we ought to desire to have that power. And that's why we ought to play by the rules. Because we go against the rules. We go against the Bible. And why is God going to give us power? God's not going to empower us when we're not playing by the rules. When we're not going by what the Bible says. God wants to be glorified. That is our main job. To glorify God. But if we are trying to do things in a way contrary to what God has told us to do. How is God being glorified in that? God's not being glorified in that. If I go and I'm like, you know what? I don't like how God said a church ought to be run. I'm going to run it my own way. And this great success happens. Well, who have I now made look good? And who have I made look bad? I made me look good. I made God look bad. Okay. Now listen, people, a lot of people run churches contrary to the way God says, and they have big churches. But you know what? Look at those churches. Anyone who thinks God is anywhere near, that's a fool. Anyone who thinks, you know, you look, you look at the Joel Osteens and the John Hagees and the Benny Hens and all those people. Anyone who would mistake that for real Christianity knows nothing about the Bible. Anyone who would go to their church and watch these shows, anyone who would go to the Willow Creeks or whatever and go into there and say, wow, you know, glory to God for that. They don't know God. All right. There, God is not glorified by that at all. And don't mistake what these people are doing for the power of God. If they have the power of God because they're filling up stadiums and stuff, then the Cubs are filled with the power of God. They sell out all the time. Okay, Listen, you put on a good show, people are going to come. It's just all there is to it. And speaking of the Cubs, it's not looking good. But you know what? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. They're down three games to nothing. I don't know if this game tonight's at Wrigley Field or not, but I, I promise you it's sold out. I, I guarantee you it's sold out. And you know what? Next year, even if the Cubs stink or in the last place, they're still going to sell their games out all the time. You know, you put on a good show, people are going to come. There's nothing to do with the power of God. And so people who think that, you know, God's not sending a conflicting message like, you know, why does, you know, why does God allow these churches to get so big? You know, I mean, isn't that kind of sending the wrong message? Listen, if you can listen to what they're preaching and think God is anywhere near that, you are just a fool. Because God has given us His Word. They're not preaching the Word of God. Don't mistake that for the power of God. Okay, And so, uh, understand though that you know this passage though, I believe it's showing that Jesus recognizes our decisions that we make in this church. You know, uh, look at Matthew chapter 18 and verse 18. Jesus said something similar uh, even before the resurrection. In verse 18, he says, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Okay? Now, we often take that one verse right there where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst. You know, as long as there's two or three gathered, you know, God's, God's there with, you know, the presence of God is there. But what it's talking about when it's saying if two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst, it's showing that whenever a decision is being made, okay, whenever decisions are being made in the church, if, they, if two or three are gathered in the name of God, he's in the midst. What does that mean? It means he is in agreement with what we're doing. He recognizes our authority to make the decisions that we're making. And so we, as a church, there is certain power, there is certain authority that we have that God recognizes. God has commanded us as a church 
to purge out the leaven. What does that mean? You know, if there's somebody coming in here preaching false doctrine and spreading false doctrine in the church, you know what? It's our responsibility to remove them from the church. If there's someone in this church, it's a member of this church, and they are being immoral, God has commanded us to remove them from the church and to deliver them to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And God recognizes that. When we as a church come together and we say, you know, Brother Lonnie, he's been out of line. Brother Lonnie's spreading false doctrine. Brother Lonnie's living immoral. And we say, he's got to go. He no longer is a part of Liberty Baptist Church. We have the authority to do that. We can throw him out. And you know what? God recognizes it. God no longer sees him as a part of this church. Heaven no longer recognizes him as a part of this church. Now, that's a pretty big deal, isn't it? That's a pretty big authority, but that's what God's saying there. And where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And so we are, our decisions that we make, they're final. Our decisions that we make are right. They're recognized in heaven as long as they go along with the Bible. Because we are meeting, we're together in His name. And, if, and so if we're doing things in His name, shouldn't it be according to His word? And so as long as what we're doing lines up with the Scripture... We have, we have that authority. God's given that authority. You know, we're allowed to make decisions on certain things. You know, there's some things that are just not spelled out in the Bible. You know, if we want to make a decision on, you know, what purchases, you know, we're going to make, how we're going to spend our money, we have the authority to do that. Okay? God didn't spell out exactly how everything's supposed to be budgeted in the church and how much should go towards salary, how much should go to building funds. You know, God, God didn't specify all that stuff for us. But you know what he has done? He has given us the authority to make those decisions and we are allowed to come together and decide how we're going to do those things and say, all right, this is how we're going to operate. This is how we're going to run these things. And heaven recognizes that authority. And then if somebody else comes along in here and they're like, well, you know what? I don't like that. I think it ought to be done this way. Listen, we've already decided as a church, this is what we're going to do. And you know what? God's on our side. Heaven's on our side. And if you don't like it, get out of here. You know, we're allowed to do that. We have certain authority as a church that God recognizes. So, um, look at verse twenty-four. It says, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. I preached another message a while back. All the words of Thomas. Look up every statement in the Bible made by Thomas, and. All of it's negative. All of it's doubting. All of it, you know, whenever Jesus wanted to go where Lazarus was, you know, let's all go, you know, so we can all die. You know, it was always stuff like that. You know, Thomas, I'm sure Thomas did some great things for the Lord, especially after this time here. But look, what is he known for? Doubting. Doubting Thomas. And he mostly got it because of this passage right here. You know, he wasn't with them when Jesus came. Thomas didn't show up for church the week before. And he missed out big time. He missed out on a miracle. He missed Jesus teleport into the room. That's pretty cool. You know, he missed getting to see Jesus after he's resurrected from the dead. So, um, verse 25, the other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands, the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe that's ridiculous. Isn't that what the world says? I want to see God first. I want to see a miracle. I want to see this. You know, show me the proof. Then I'll believe. But you know what? Is God okay with that? Is God impressed with that? Now, thank God for Tom. God was merciful in this situation. But it says, And after eight days again, His disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Teleported again. Tells him peace again. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas, had answered, Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Okay? Thomas didn't impress anybody here with his the fact that he believed at this moment because of the fact that he had seen and you know what we need to understand we have a wonderful opportunity living in the day that we do because you know it's easier for us to show faith 
Jesus Christ is not here in the flesh. You know, it was one thing for John, that disciple whom Jesus loved, it was one thing for him to have a closeness with Jesus. He was able to lay on his breast. He was able to be right there physically with them and have a closeness with them. But what if we have a closeness with them when we just have the Holy Spirit that we can't see? What if we have a closeness with Christ right now? Well, you know what? That shows great faith right there. You know, it was one thing for John. I'm not taking away from anything that John did, but I believe it is more impressive. I believe it is more pleasing to God when right now we have a closeness with him. This is a great opportunity. We are living in a great day, a day when we can show real faith. It's, a, it's an opportunity to be living in the wicked times that we're living in. You know, we all know the names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But you know, if they'd have been living in Israel during one of the good times, we wouldn't know who they were. Why do we know who they were? Because they were taken captive. They were living in a wicked time. They were living in a time when everyone was compromising and worshiping the image except for those three. They were living in a time when there was, they were sentenced to death if you didn't worship that image. But you know what? They had faith in a time when it was hard to find, and now we all know their names. So what, why, why wouldn't we be excited about living in the wicked times we're living in? We ought to be thankful for it. I think we ought to be excited about tribulation. The Bible tells us, you know, we ought to leap for joy when we're persecuted. Well, you know, uh, why can't it be like back in the day when Christianity was popular? Well, you know, that'd be nice, but you know what? There's not a lot of rewards for living through days like that. If you'd really like to get the eternal rewards, you're better off living in days like today or especially during the tribulation. If we were really eternally minded, we would want to be alive during that time. We would want to be there for that stuff. We would want to face those things. We would embrace tribulation. We were, we're told to do that in the Bible. Lots of us don't have a lot of faith. But we actually can prove it right now. And so we ought to think, but Tom, we ought to be thankful for it. But Thomas missed out. Thomas missed out because he was a doubter. Thomas missed out on a lot of blessings because he had to see Jesus before he would believe. And I do, I believe he missed out on some great blessings because of that. So verse 30 says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. We see in these last two verses here that the whole point of the book of John is to get us to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ because that is what saves. That is how you get saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I'm writing you these things so you will believe and that by believing you might have life through his name. That's, why, that's what John's all about. That's why we like to give, you know, we give people John and Romans and things like that. John's one of the best books that you can give to someone who's lost or a, a new convert or something because these peop, you know, people need to read John so they will believe. So they'll believe these stories. Oh, well, you know, that's, that's pretty far-fetched stuff. Well, listen... <laughs> If they don't believe, they're not going to get saved. We can't make anybody believe something. You know, we can't change things. You know, we, I, I think the best thing we can do for them is just give them what the Bible says. Tell them to read the book of John. If they believe it, they'll be saved. If they don't believe it, they won't get saved. And, you know, it's not up to us to force people to get We can't do it. We can only give, give the message and pray that it, it takes hold. And... It will with some, it won't with others. And it's just up to us to spread it around. So the story of Thomas, it's a reminder to us that you know, just because we're saved, just because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean we've arrived. It, it's easy for us to get frustrated with those who won't get saved. Why won't they believe? It's so simple. But you know, we need to remember that even though we're saved, we often don't believe the promises that God gave us. And, you know, I wonder if all of us would be better soul winners if we just had a little more faith. And, it is, and we do. We get all that. Man, why won't they believe? Why won't they believe? Well, you know what? Why won't you believe that God keeps his promises? Why won't you believe he's going to answer that prayer that you prayed? Why don't you believe those things? And maybe if we were more believing in our own personal lives and had more faith, I believe 
we would be more convincing when we're giving people the gospel. I believe we would be more effective in our soul winning. If you want to be a good soul winner, I don't think it's so much about how polished your presentation is. I think it's about how much faith you have, how much you believe God. Good luck. You know, you might have believed enough to get saved. Okay. You know, you, you might have had that, just that, that little bit of faith, but it was enough and it got, it got you saved. But you know what? How are you going to get other people to believe in a God that you hardly believe in yourself, that you're constantly doubting? I don't know this, but I think, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if before this point, Thomas was one of the worst soul winners Jesus had. I don't know. I don't know if him and Judas ever went out together. They probably got nothing done. <laughs> but I mean, they were, they were probably they were probably the worst team. I, I I don't know who Thomas usually worked with, but you know, I, I wonder if that's our problem sometimes. You know, we're saved, but we're we're not increasing our faith. We don't even really believe that those people we give the gospel to are going to get saved. Well, if you don't believe it, what makes you think they're going to believe it? We just need to. That's why we have the Book of John, so we will believe. And so we can trust him. And it's the same thing First John. These things have I written unto you. That belief, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that believing ye might have life through his name. First John is written for two purposes. It's written for saved people, so they can know that they're saved, so that it will increase their faith. And in case someone's not saved, it will help cause them to believe, so they can be saved. So... Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. A great, great story there. Let's learn from these things. Let's trust his word. Let's have faith. Learn from the angels. They don't understand unbelief. They don't understand doubting. Learn from Thomas's mistake. Let's just trust the word of God. If it says it, just go ahead and believe it. Don't, don't correct it. Don't change it. Just believe it. So with that, let's all stand together.